Get your music across the finish line with X Racer Productions. Our artist focus services include production, distribution, gigs, and more. Connect with us at xracerproductions.com. This is the X Racer Podcast, music makers on making music. I'm your host, Sean Ford, and today on the show we have with us San Francisco-based veteran musician and producer, Kevin Seal. Welcome to the show, Kevin. How you doing? I'm doing great, Sean. Thanks for having me. So let's start at the beginning. Think back to when you were a small person. What inspired you to get into music? As a small person, it was being exposed to jazz. My parents were both huge jazz fans. And so they would take me to see big bands performing in Cincinnati, where I grew up, all the time. And we had, at the time, a dedicated jazz station in Cincinnati called WNOP. And they would put on shows all the time. We'd go see those shows, and they would have live trivia contests. And I would take part in the trivia contests and answer questions and you know, win cases of ginger ale and stuff like that. Like yeah. Those are some of my earliest memories of going to see shows was going to see these big bands in the park with my parents. Yeah. So yeah, they, they were listening to you know, Louis Armstrong and Count Basie and Ella Fitzgerald. And that was really what I knew of music before anything else. Mm -hmm. So I heard almost nothing but jazz for, for you know, my really little years. Yeah. And it you know, really kind of sunk in and soaked in uh, and really kind of informed everything else that I was excited about. So did you start out with piano? I did. Yeah, I when I was five, I told them I wanted to play piano. And you did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it was probably, you know, just I think listening to all this jazz that they were just listening to on the radio, and I was hearing lots of piano, and I was like, I want to play that. And we didn't have a piano at the time, so they got me a toy piano, this little, you know, 16-key, you know, dinky-dink yeah. dink toy. And sure enough, I, I would practice it, and I was learning stuff on there. And they're like, okay, well, let's let's get them lessons. And, you know, one thing led to another, and they they bought a piano. And I took some group lessons at the Baldwin factory in Cincinnati. Uh, Cincinnati, a lot of the Baldwins are made there. And so, you know, they would have a bunch of these little five-year-olds sitting around on headphones. That is really cool. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great. I was really lucky to be exposed to all that. So, yeah, from a really early age, I was really How did driven. that make you feel, though, being in the factory playing a Baldwin? At the time, I didn't think anything of it. It was just where we all went. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I loved the idea that we were all kind of sitting around and each of us had our own piano to be on, you know, and, yeah. um, but it, it, I don't think I really recognized how cool that was until years later. Yeah. 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 So you may not be able to see this, but I'm shedding a little tear as I listen to you say this, because when I was six years old, my mother sent me to this old, old grandmother lady for piano lessons and I'd go to the lessons and she would give me this little sort of cardboard keyboard to take home to practice, which I thought was the strangest thing in the world, right? And we didn't have a piano, and we never got a piano, and I never got one of those little toy piano things. So I kind of, at, a, at six years old, I kind of said, this makes no fucking sense, how can I actually learn how to play the piano without a piano? So I'm, I'm glad to know that you had a much better experience um, in Cincinnati coming up. Cincinnati worked out well for that. Yeah. And thank and you know, my parents were really supportive of it. And uh, you know, I'm really grateful that they were encouraging. So when did it get to the point for you where you said, hey, you know, this is really serious music becoming really a big part of your life? I think it was when I was 12 years old. And at that point, I had stopped taking lessons and I was, you know, just playing soccer and stuff like that. Like I, I would still play on my own, but I was really bad at practicing and really not, I didn't have any discipline about it or anything. And uh, my friend Josh Schricker, his parents took us to see Miles Davis at the Cincinnati wow. Music Hall. Yeah. So this would have been 1988, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that show just completely blew my mind. I, I I remember they ended with uh, the song Porsche, and each of them took a solo and then st and just walked off the stage. Yeah. So one by one, this long, really ethereal, beautiful ballad 
they'd play their bit and then they'd walk off and you could tell they were done for the night. It just ended with one keyboard player playing these long, really beautiful sort of sustained Eastern sounding chords. And then that faded out and the lights went down. And that song in particular, I was just like, I got to take this seriously. Like I, I need to, if I'm going to do this, I need to do it like that. You know, I like, I really need to dig in and, and be serious about this. Yeah. And sure enough, and so I talked to my parents. I was like, I, I want to start taking lessons again. Mm-hmm. And I want to start taking jazz lessons. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, they found a piano player that they were seeing playing in like hotel ballrooms, basically in Cincinnati, this guy, Frank Vincent, and and contacted him and asked him if he was teaching. And sure enough, he was. And so I started studying jazz harmony with him. And, and that that's when I really, you know, started taking it seriously and was like, you know, this is what I want to be doing. That's fantastic. Was your first band a jazz band? Well, I played in the school's jazz bands. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first real sort of band that I was in was called Equinox, and we did a lot of sort of long form jazz, you know, noodly stuff. <laughs> but it was probably more along the lines of, you know, Grateful Dead inspired. Yeah, you know, that kind of exploring. Yeah, um, rather than full on, you know, jazz. I, I don't know. We played like blue bossa and stuff like that. So I guess we did some jazz. Um, but uh, yeah, it was more just a jam band. Speaking of jam band, you've got a song for us today that you're going to play in a minute that you brought some musicians together into Hyde Street Studios as part of a project called The Hideout Sessions. Tell us a little bit about the song we're about to hear. Yes. So this is a song that the live session with was with Christopher Fortier on bass, Chris McGrew on drums, and Darren Johnston on trumpet. And then I played piano on it. And we added overdubs later of Christopher Fortier on guitar and Kimo Ball on instrument. But the four of us, Fortier, McGrew, and Ball and myself, were in a band called Griddle for about 15 years here in the Bay Area. And then Darren is someone that we've known for 20 years. And Darren's just an amazing jazz player. I mean, not just jazz, but modern classical. And, you know, he's, he's got his fingers in, in a bunch of different pies as well. So we were thrilled to get a chance to come in here and experiment in the studio with him. But yeah, it's a, a set of chords that I'd been kicking around for a bunch of years and had never really finished into a song until I knew that we were going to do this. And so I was like, okay, I got to write some lyrics and, and make this happen. So I, I gave him all the charts that day and we read through it here in the studio. And I was completely blown away by what they brought to it and how they played on it. So yeah, it's a song called Oakland is Beautiful This Time of Year, um, which of course, Oakland is beautiful all times of year. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's check it out from the Hideout Sessions. Oakland is Beautiful This Time of Year. Thinking of your face Scrunching up your brows
So the song we just heard was part of the hideout sessions, which is sort of like a jam session in the studio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how long were you all actually in the studio to make this song? Four hours, I think, maybe five hours total. And then the, the mallet sounds that you hear are the instrument, and that was done at home afterward. Kimo recorded that at his house. But trumpet, bass, guitar, piano, vocals, drums. The vocals were all done live. Those weren't overdubs. So that mm-hmm. was as we were playing. It was sung. I sang it. And then, uh, yeah, I, I think it was four hours total. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and the changes, I mean, most of what they're playing, they're just improvising. So I just gave them the most basic, bare bones, couple of chord names, and then they just improvise it. We all improvise it together. And so it's really giving a lot of respect to the room, too. Right. I mean, we have so much deference for the amazing music that's been made in yeah. this room uh, over the course of 50 years. Uh, I mean, there's just this massive legacy and, you know, just Studio ground, C at Hyde Street. Studio C at Hyde Street. I mean, just groundbreaking recordings have been done here. So... Coming in for these hideout sessions, it's just, okay, let's see what what happens when we get into this room together. So who has some changes, who has who has an idea, who has a feel for it, and then we just write it together on the spot. Well, what I really like about that track is is really the, the, the idea that you bring a, a, a group of musicians together, and there's a lot of impro- improvisation that goes on, and it really ends up with a groovy... A groovy track. I mean, it feels like something that you had worked on for quite a bit of time. Is that really more of a function of the musicians themselves, the relationships you guys have? How did that magic come together? That's a big part of it. Because uh, we we've all known each other for twenty years, probably all the people that are in that room, and have played together in a variety of configurations. And we all know walking into that room that we just have such respect for what what the other people bring to it and that we we're, we're willing to leave that space open for them to fill it with whatever ideas they want to throw at it. So yeah, that's in, in the case of that particular song, it just happens to be people that really love each other a lot and have been working together for a really long time and, and making music together for decades. Is there, in terms of live performances, is there room today for improv on stage? Is that something that we're still seeing happening? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's tons of room for improv on stage. And the bands that I tend to enjoy seeing the most are the bands that leave that space for each show to be unique and for each show to have that interaction with the audience and that conversation with each other. Because when you when you leave that space for the improvisation, it's you're letting the musicians all talk to each other and you're letting that conversation flow and encouraging that to be its own experience in that moment. So I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing so many people going out to see live music now. I mean, live music is doing better than it ever has in terms of ticket sales and venues being full. And here in San Francisco, we've got so many venues that are doing really well. So yeah, I think there's a a huge call for that. And you know, the studio and the live environment feed each other, but I, I think letting the studio environment have some of that off the cuff feel of a live performance. Mm -hmm. If you can do it, if you can make it happen, there's a magic to that. That's, that can't be replicated with people in their home studios and their project studios, at least not as easily, not sounding like that. Mm -hmm. This is Music Makers on Making Music. We're with Kevin Seal, and we'll be right back. Come down to Wally's Hideout at the historic Hyde Street Studio C to make your record. We've got classic acoustics, vintage mic preamps, and a great mic cabinet. Our experienced team knows just how to get the most out of this room. We continue the tradition of making great records in this fantastic acoustic space and can't wait to get started working with you. So go to wallyshideout.com and contact one of our engineers. What's up, this is Pamela Parker. I wanna let you know about my new album, the Fantastic Machine, out now. You can order it online. And I want to connect with you, so go to PamelaParkerRocks.com. You are listening to Music Makers on Making Music, an X-Racer production. Follow X-Racer Productions on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
and connect with us at xracerproductions.com. We're with Kevin Seal on Music Makers on Making Music. And Kevin, um, I'm really concerned about the culture that we have today. And specifically, I'm wondering where we are in terms of creativity in music and where we are in terms of artists even feeling empowered to be creative, to be experimental with their music. We've got technology that makes it easier uh, to make music. But what are your thoughts on where, where the culture is today in terms of creativity? I think there's a tremendous amount of amazing music being made that a lot of people just aren't hearing. I, I think there's there's a huge wealth of great players working right now and making really interesting, vibrant, vital recordings that aren't really making it out to mass audiences so well. And that's a function of a lot of different things. I mean, I think the internet has a lot to do with that too. Um, but if we can find ways for these musicians to to find audiences that would be receptive, anything that we can do to foster that will help. I, I think there's a lot of great music that's just not finding an audience right now. So yeah. I, I think there's a lot of tremendous creativity, but uh, it's a difficult time for people to afford to be devoting as much time as they need to to their craft. Yeah. So really, you think it's more of a function of of pushing examples of, of creative musical talent forward versus, I mean, you know, we've got pop radio, we've got sort of all the online streaming, we're living in an Instagram world where I think Kylie Jenner is probably the most popular person mm -hmm. in the world right now. And so uh, everybody else is sort of flying underneath the radar. You know, one of the things that we hope to do with this podcast is to at least in some small way create an opportunity for people to become more familiar with a broader range of musical talent but we're just we're just one piece of we're just one piece of that of that picture uh, what do you what as a musician do you have any recommendations that you would make for other musicians given that challenge I do I I think there are some examples of big mainstream pop albums that have had just unbelievable musicianship and great playing. I think, you know, everything that Kendrick Lamar has done for the past decade, I would recommend any musicians that aren't really familiar with his whole catalog yeah. to dig in and, and really hear that stuff. Yeah. Cause it's, it's making it to a big audience too. And it's shining a light on a lot of really gifted players that hadn't really, had that exposure before before he invited them to play on his sessions. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot that I would recommend to musicians, but I think finding some common ground that we're all in these little silos right now, it feels like. Yeah. I think a lot of musicians tend to work in their really, just their vicinity sure. of just people that they know. And and that's there's something healthy about that too. But I think struggling to find stuff that all of us can listen to and at least have some sort of agreement on right. now, since we don't really have top 40 radio the way it used to right i think finding some you know some ways to connect with musicians who may be in very different styles from yourself yeah. is is a big step forward yeah yeah it it, it seems you know uh, music education has sort of fallen by the wayside in america um and so that becomes a limiter in terms of the ability to not only develop your craft practice but also try different instruments right you know right. and that's something that i that, that i've heard you talk about is you know the opportunities to try an instrument um and sometimes it actually takes being able to collaborate with or even meet and talk to other musicians who open up those opportunities mm -hmm. so you know that's that's something that we see as being very important with x racer and uh, thank you for your input on that. I want to ask you about another, another thing that's a big concern of mine uh, relative to the culture, and that's also its relevancy. It's, it's the notion of, you know, we're living in some very challenging times, politically, climate change, you name it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
you know, autocrats and fascists somehow making a comeback in the world. And, you know, I grew up in a time uh, during the 70s where it was like whether it was rock or R&B, you know, artists were, their music was very relevant. It was very personal. Mm -hmm. Where are we now? Well, I think a lot of musicians are in such a state of shock, even keeping up with what's going on in the news, that it's been challenging for, you know, the next what's going on or the next London Calling. I mean, there there's so many brilliant examples throughout throughout the history of recorded music of of these uh these albums that helped people in times of political duress. And I think that music is being made. I think right now we're still in shock. <laughs> and yeah. and I, I think that that music is coming and that people are working on that. Uh, I, I think seeking out music that seeks to be, uh, to se that seeks to give strength and solace in a time that people are just, people are depressed. People are depressed and they're freaking out. And that's not always the best recipe for an environment for making music. Sure. So in other words, the way you see it is, it's all part of a process. And people are in sort of the step right now where they're sort of, in the trauma, so to speak. Yes. But once they come out of that trauma, they'll find their voice. And so perhaps just over the horizon, we may expect a flood of music that really speaks to these times. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that music is coming. I think it's being made right now. It's being made and being finished right now. Yeah. I think we're about to see a big floodgate open. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I think this is a good time to let our audience know that you're going to be coming on board as one of the producers and hosts of uh, Music Makers on Making Music in X Racer Production. And we're very excited that you're going to be joining our team. And I think that given all of your experience and perspective as a musician and a consumer of music as well, that you're really going to be able to help us achieve our objective, which is to foster really relevant discussions around music with the people that make music. Great, great. Well, I, I love what's happening so far with X-Racer. So I'm excited to, to bring whatever I can to help push it forward. So having said that, do you have anything that you'd like to shamelessly plug right now? Absolutely. I, I would like to encourage anyone listening to check out the music that we have up at citizen510.com. That is the Citizen 5 stuff. And at 2020minloop.com. That's the 20 minute loop site. To go check out the original music that we've been putting out the last couple of years. Uh, we have a variety of recordings, in the case of 20 minute loop, going back to the late 90s. But with Citizen 5, we have all the stuff that the people contributing to that have played on before as well. So everything that Nate Cameron did before coming to California, too. So Nate came from this really great collective called GPNYC. It's Guerrilla Publishing NYC. And it's uh, writers in New Orleans as well as New York and now in California and Cincinnati who are all contributing to each other's work and creating this kind of cross-cultural, you know, across-the-continent creative effort. So there are a lot of really amazing, you know, hip hop musicians in that collective as well. Uh, so I would encourage you to, to look into those sites and check out all the material that you can find on there. Thanks for that, Kevin. Kevin Seal, building community, making music in the Bay Area. Thanks for coming on the show. Kevin, we look forward to future shows with you as the host. You have a great weekend. Thank you, Sean. It's been a pleasure. You are listening to Music Makers on Making Music, an X Racer production. Follow X Racer Productions on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and connect with us at xracerproductions.com.